Welcome to Truth Speakers, a Burning Lights Ministries podcast. I am Katie Bowers, full-time mom and full-time evangelist. I'm here to encourage you to be and train the next generation of truth speakers. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share, and follow us on all of our social media platforms. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Truth Speakers. I am so excited about today's podcast. I have my good friend, Mariah Logan from Edgewood, Illinois. She pastors Edgewood Full Gospel Church, and she does an amazing job. Today, we're going to talk about um, insecurities. And uh, I because I think both of us, we've talked about this in the past, both of us have um, dealt with insecurities in our life. Um, and now here we are both, uh, full-time in the ministry, uh, just following the leadership of the Holy ghost. So, uh, say hi, Mariah. (laughs) Hey everybody. It's so good to be with you. So glad to be on the podcast. Katie and Elijah are both doing an amazing job, um, with their podcast, with their ministry, with their children. And so, um, I'm just so thankful for our friendship and so glad to be with all of you guys today. All right. That's awesome. So. I'm just going to dive right into this. So Mariah, whenever you, um, okay, let me ask this first. How old were you when you first started preaching? When I first started preaching, I don't, I did not preach my first sermon until about two, three years ago. So that's when I first, so I'm 27 now. So about 20, 25. Okay. Awesome. So was that like in your home church or how did you get that start? Yeah, I preached my very first um, service in my home church, and I was actually the worship pastor at the time, and just some situations happened, and they they needed me to preach, and so um, I said yes to the call, which that seems to be such um, a huge thing is just saying yes. I think that's something I've learned so much in my life is there's so many opportunities that God gives us. And we just have to be willing to say yes. We just have to be willing, even if we've never preached a sermon before, even if we think this is out of my comfort zone, this is not because I very much identified with like the girl behind the piano. I've played and Mm -hmm. sang for a long time. I love to lead worship. But then when this opportunity came to begin preaching, I I really didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know what the Lord was going to do with it. So it was just, again, one of those Sundays, hey, we need a preacher. We need someone to preach. Mariah, will you do it? I said yes. And then um, kind of that's honestly how I got my start with preaching the gospel. Wow, that's awesome. So that's so funny because that's totally how I ended up playing the drums. <laughs> <laughs> because so uh, my mom was the drummer at our church before me. And then one night we were having like a blowout service and my mom just gets off the drums. I don't remember if she was shouting or praying for somebody or what. And I was standing up in the altar and I was, I guess I was the only one clapping on beat because my pastor just looks at me and was like, get up there and play. And I was like, no. (laughs) And he said, get up there and play. And I was like, okay. And I was only like nine years old when that happened. And I've been playing ever since. (laughs) There was a young girl um, with the AFBC team. They just were at our church and they said she had only been playing the drums for like less than a year and she did an awesome job. And I was talking to her afterwards and I'm like, you'll go so far just because you were willing to say yes. Just because you're willing to go, you know what? There's a need. We don't have a drummer. Um, You know, I can (laughs) I can keep beat. I'm clap on rhythm. And so, and she said yes. And I mean, what a blessing it was to our church. But I, I, I'm just, I'm excited to see what the Lord does with it because, man, what God can do with a simple yes, with simple obedience, we we can't even understand it. It far surpasses anything that we can wrap our minds around. Just like you, you know, who would have thought at nine years old and now you're traveling the country playing the drums and not just playing yeah. the drums, but preaching. And I don't want to get too far ahead of anything, but I think a lot of people want to get to the thing that they see as the most important. Maybe that's preaching. I don't know what it is for your life, but they're not willing to say yes to the drums at nine years old when maybe nobody's seeming to listen it's a blowout service everybody's drunk in the holy ghost anyways but it's like you know no one cares but it's like but let that small seed that willingness to say yes to taking out the trash playing the drums singing a special because a lot of times we think we just jump to the preaching jump to the pastoring jump to being the full-time evangelist but 
That's not how it works. It starts with something small. And then as we continue to be faithful in the small things, God will increase us into the bigger things. Amen. And I think you probably experience this more because you're a pastor and you take care of a church um, that you see the value of the whole congregation. You know, I, I, I learned this, um, especially in our tent revival we had back in Beckley that we talk about all the time where God mm-hmm. raised the man from the dead that we had like 40 souls saved. It was just over the top. And something I learned because that meeting went for, I think it was five weeks. Wow. And, um, you know, after you get so long, like we're the ones paying for, um, the meeting to be there. Right. Yeah. So yeah. like, there's so much money going out of our pocket. And then one of our friends came cause you know, we're, we're paying for the portage on we're you know, and it's, we're having to pay for extra emptying out because there's a, there's a larger crowd than we had expected. Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, here comes our friend with a bunch of like, um, he had his whole car stacked full of like, um, Germex bottles. And it was like, you had no idea how fast we were going through those bottles. Yeah. And I mean, I know that seems like, well, that's like $7. It doesn't matter. Well, it matters to us whenever we're out of pocket paying for a meeting this size this long. And I think you probably see the value in that a lot as a pastor, when you see people just help, even if they're never holding a microphone. Absolutely. It's we're the body of Christ for a reason. And the Bible talks about, you know, the the we see things as the lesser parts the more important parts but that's just not how it functioned and we can realize that when we do something like stub our pinky toe and it seems like such a little thing but when you stub your pinky toe it's like man such a little thing can hurt so much but that's why people need to understand that no matter your part your part has value no matter what you're functioning in you need to do what the lord tells you to do and be who he's called you to be because it doesn't matter who you are, your your part matters. And and just like that with just the, the revival that we just had, you know, we needed people to come in and people did that clean between the services. So we yeah. could be ready to go for the next service. You know, people don't think about things like that, but you know, taking out the trash between services, replacing the Kleenex boxes, vacuuming the floor because people are in and out. Um, and, and again, people just see the preacher but when you understand um, your that God has placed value on you and value on your calling, that that person that's coming in and cleaning is as valuable as anybody else. And, and it doesn't matter who's on stage or not. What matters is that we're functioning in our part in the body of Christ. That's awesome. So one thing you just said, I feel like that is just going to lead us right into the topic I really wanted to get into today. And that is seeing the value of your calling. So one thing, actually, one of the first things I noticed about you whenever I met you in person was, um, okay, so whenever I got started, especially, um, everyone would tell me, um, you're a woman preacher, the men are going to beat you down, (laughs) you know, you gotta, you know, you're going to get ready, you know, the guys are going to beat you up over it. But I can, I can sit here and honestly tell you, I have had way more problems out of the women in ministry than I have the men. One of the most humiliating moments of my life was in front of a woman pastor because she humiliated me in front of her entire church and come to find out it was all centered out of jealousy. And one thing I noticed about you was I didn't feel any like jealousy or rivalry. Like girls can get so catty. Can't they? (laughs) Like, Like, if you if you do this better than me, like you, uh, you're automatically a, a competitor. You know, we're in a competition, whatever. And the body of Christ is not supposed to be like that. You know, no, it's, no. it's it's we're supposed to be working this thing together. And that's something I noticed about you when I first met you, because I was like, she genuinely is just confident in who she is, and in turn, that that affects greatly how she treats the people around her because I can't tell you how many times I've been around people that you know I was still working on myself Mm -hmm. but because they were still insecure all they did was tear me down just to lift themselves up higher and um that's one thing I just really appreciated you so how, how do you feel like you kind of have gotten to this place where you can walk in confidence and really see the value of your calling? 
Yeah, well, I'll back up and say I, I, I know exactly what you're saying about it's actually usually women that don't like women in ministry. I yeah. don't know why that is, but that's been my experience as well. And just like that, um, you know, for your men listeners, but it's also interesting how it's usually Christians that hurt Christians instead right. of, you know, it, it's usually the people within the church. It's usually the people that you should have commonality on common ground, be able to lift each other up. But the devil tries to make a root in there and get people full of jealousy, bitterness, all these things towards each other. And that is not how it should be. I love the um, scripture in Psalm one, um, 133 that says that where there's unity, I know the NLT says where's there, the, where there's harmony, that God will send his blessing. He commands the blessing. And I think people don't understand that when they get out of unity, God cannot bless it. When there's right. that cattiness that you're talking about, when women are against women and we're tearing each other down and man, they think they're all that. And, and, and all these silly things that people say that God cannot bless that. He cannot bless a church. He cannot bless a, a ministry that is not in unity. And so that's for me. I mean, I was maybe tempted to get into that of um, not feeling confident in myself. So tearing down other people or seeing people tear me down. And, and I thought it was because they didn't like me or because I was doing something wrong, but come to find out, no, it's because they're jealous. So yeah. I fight with everything I have against that because I want, I want the blessing of God on my life. I want the yeah. blessing of God in my church. I want the blessing of God in my ministry. Time is too short to be worried about stupid fights within the church, silly comparisons. I mean, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And if we're so insecure, if we're so focused on the things within the, the, the body of Christ that we're missing the people that are dying and going to hell. I mean, shame on us, shame on us. If that's, that's what we're doing. So it's like, know your calling, know who God called you to be and walk in that because then there's blessing. And then the body of Christ can do what the body of Christ is supposed to do function as, as Jesus wanted his church to function. And, you know, he said he's coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. But, you know, within that, he's coming back with a, for a church that's not catty. That's not right. insecure. <laughs> you know, no bride wants to be insecure on her wedding day. Man, can that's you right. think about that? If you would have walked down the aisle to Elijah and been thinking like, I hope that he's not looking at another woman or he's thinking about somebody else. I mean, if that would have been the case, you should have told him, Hey, uh, see you later. I'm not marrying you, you know, right. but that's how people with the church function. We have a bridegroom that's coming back and we're so worried about everybody else, but our eyes need to be on the bridegroom. We need to be a bride full of confidence, a bride knowing my bridegroom loves me and his, yeah. his love for others doesn't take away his love for me. Amen. Does, does that make that. You know, I think people are like, they see God moving in other people's life. And somehow that means that he can't move for them. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. God, can, that's putting God in this very small box. It's limiting him to saying, oh, he can only move in so-and-so's. He can only move in Katie and Elijah's ministry, but not here in Edgewood. No, God can, God moving for Katie is a celebration for me because that's just the kingdom of God advancing. God moving in Edgewood is, is great for Katie and Elijah because it's the kingdom of God advancing. I get so tired and excuse me for going on this rant. I will get to your question, but I get so tired um, of being with other ministers that just want to talk bad about other ministries that just yeah, want to do this and that. And it's, Stop comparing and be excited. Rejoice with those re who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Be excited to see the kingdom of God advancing, no matter if it's at your church, at somebody else's church, somebody else's ministry, your ministry, because it, that comparison gets in there and it seals people's joy. It seals the blessing. It seals the favor of God. So we must walk in confidence. We must walk um, in knowing who God has called us to be. And I believe was your original question, how did I get to walk to, to begin to walk in that confidence? Correct. Um, yeah. I, I talk so much. I, I forgot. No, what, follow the flow. Follow the flow. <laughs> well, I would say that comparison, first of all, is the biggest the the biggest thing that I had to overcome. And yeah. um, I think that there's two types of comparison. I think there's the, the comparison that we think about that's like, I'm not as good as them. 
I'm not as good as a singer as them. I'm not as good as a preacher as them. Man, they flow in the gifts a lot better than me. There's, they're prettier than me. You know, girls, we, you know, I, I'm not sure if guys fall into that, but I know girls do. Oh, they, they look better than me. They, you know, all, they dress better than me. They have more than me. They're, you know, they're married. I'm not married. They have kids. I don't have kids. What, you know, all the things that the devil tries to do. But I also think there's the other type of comparison where we think, well, at least I'm doing better than them. At, mm -hmm. at least, at least uh, my That's church so is bigger yeah. than their church. And so we kind of have this scale of like who we're lesser than and who we're above than. And like, mm -hmm. well, as long as I'm still better than them, I'm okay. But, I, I, you know, I, I'm never going to reach that height. And I've just learned to walk in confidence and walk in who God's called me to be. I have got to stop comparing to other people. I had to stop it. And, um, I, I think that there's such in our culture because we are on our phones so much, we see things as like, and even in the church world, you could take it outside. Like, and I know people talk about that a lot where, you know, they went on a vacation, they just got a new car that, you know, their kids are in the most expensive clothes and, and all these type of things. But then also in the church world, you're seeing pictures of, you know, their church was full on Sunday and mine only had so many people their church is doing that their ministry is doing this and and we compare so much but i think if i could say it in our 2024 day language stay in your lane stop yeah. trying to be somebody else stop trying to tear them down stop trying to tear yourself down understand that we as the body of christ need to stay in our lane to do what God has called us to do. Paul wrote, I press forward with everything that's within me to reach the goal. I can't mm -hmm. press forward to reach the goal God has for me if I'm worried about Katie's goal. If I'm right, worried- Right, so that's Joel chapter two. That's that, that army that God talked about. Yeah. That in Joel chapter two, they stayed in their rank. They yeah. didn't worry about their ranking. That's they right. just did their best and yeah. where they were supposed to be. Yeah. And it's like when you begin to compare, when you begin to get out of rank, I don't believe the, the things that God wants accomplished can get accomplished because mm -hmm. you're not doing what he's called you to do. And that's one thing I would say as a pastor that I've learned each church kind of has its own DNA. And, you know, there's other churches that do great things that I, I'm not saying it's wrong. Not it's it's not wrong to be inspired by other people. I'm inspired by other pastors all the time, what they're doing, you know, things they're doing in their church. But at the same time, I don't do things just because it's what everybody else is doing. Right. My ministry doesn't just, well, we, every, you know, the church down the street's doing that, so we're gonna do that. No, it's Holy Ghost led. Holy Spirit, what do you have for, for us? Because maybe right. that's not gonna work for us, but it worked great for, for the church down the road. And again, celebrating that, but understanding what God has for us. And you can make that personally. Sometimes we just do things because it's what everybody else is doing, but we are to walk being led by the spirit, walk after the spirit, not the things of the flesh. And your flesh wants to compare, your flesh wants to compete, your flesh wants to just do what, you know, Joe's doing down the road, but I don't wanna do that. I wanna be led by the spirit of God and not be insecure about what he's asked me to do, what he's asked my church to do. And I love that it's, I believe it's Thomas Jefferson that said, comparison is the thief of joy. And that's, mm -hmm. it's not Bible, but it's still true. Comparison okay. <laughs> is, is the thief of joy that when, when I've in the past found myself comparing or honestly, even now when I, it's like, when I start to slip into that immediately, I, I repent and say, Lord, like, I don't, I don't want to compare because it steals my joy. And here's the thing, Katie, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So mm -hmm. when you begin to compare, then you lose your joy and then you become weak and you can't even do what you're supposed to be doing because you, and you want like, oh man, where's, where's my joy? Where's my strength? I just feel tired. I feel weary because you started to compare and you didn't keep your eyes on the prize. You didn't keep your eyes focused on what God wanted you to do. So I think that's honestly my number one lesson I've learned is stop comparing. And I wanted to read this scripture. This is Psalm 139. Um, to, let's start, I'll just start in verse 23. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Know me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. And learning to pray that prayer about myself. Don't yeah. test Katie. 
Don't test another ministry. No, God, I'm getting personal just with me and you. Anything yeah. in me that offends you, anything in me that's not what you have. Maybe there's things I've done or I've started that God's going, I never asked you to start that. And you yeah. want me to bless something that I didn't even tell you to do. And you're you're so anxious because you're comparing. So many times it, it, I've, I've had that in my life. Know my anxious thoughts. Well, your anxiety, the anxiousness is coming because you've co started comparing yourself to somebody else. And we got to get back to the basics of Christianity. Who am I supposed to compare myself to? Jesus, the word of God. Yeah, that's right. That's true holiness. Yeah. And, and holiness is is not optional. That's holiness right. It's not optional. So, and sometimes I make, I'm saying we, maybe your listeners can relate to this. You make holiness an option, but being the best and being compared to somebody else, that's your number one goal. And we get it all mm -hmm. switched around. No, my number one goal is to be, to be like Jesus, to be who this word wants me to be. I compare myself to the word of God. I compare myself mm -hmm. to what his, what his word says. I compare myself, myself to his standard, not the standard of this world. And when you begin to compare yourself to his standard, instead of the standard of this world, joy comes, freedom comes. You're able to walk in your calling because you're not worried about what everybody else thinks. You're worried about what he thinks. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt this video, but I wanted to let you know if you hop on over to burninglightsministries.com, not only can you find an itinerary of our revival schedule, our tent revivals, whatever we have planned, it's going to be on that schedule. Uh, you can look at, see the details of whatever, wherever we're going to be, the dates, the times, all of those cool things. But also there's a giving page on burninglightsministries.com. What we do, we do it full time. We do a uh, not only this podcast, these videos, but we preach anywhere between 275 to 300 services every single year, all while taking care of all of our kids, our three young children. And we're just trying to keep the roads hot for Jesus. We want everybody to know about who Jesus is. And so if you believe in what we're doing, we would love for you to hop on there and maybe give us a love offering or become a partner. You can look at those options, whatever is convenient for you. We would be be so honored if you would help us out we love you guys now get back to that video there's something um my husband elijah says a lot he says you know whenever we're taking up offerings under the tent or whenever he'll say we're not doing the best but we're doing our best and i think that is a mindset that has carried us through a lot because you know, especially we travel, we travel, we preach anywhere between 270 to five to 300 services every, every year. Yeah. And it's like every single week, we're in a new state, a new town, a different church. And you would not believe the talent that we have seen through the years. I mean, we've had to sing in front of people who had degrees and classical music, you know, we've had to play in front of people who's played instruments in front of like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And it's like, you're looking around thinking, why aren't they up here? Why am I the person up here? But one day, um, actually it was in the very beginning of my ministry, the first couple of years, I, I fought insecurity so hard. It was so bad. I mean, it was to the point that it really was like an anxiety. Like I could not keep food down. I was losing weight. Um, I was just tormented by the whole thing. Yeah. And um, there was a lot, there still is. Our pastor has an anointing to um, raise up young preachers. And um, so we always have a lot of young preachers around us in our church, around camp meetings that we have annually. And um, at that time, in my book, some of the best preachers that has ever, you know, that I've ever been around was coming up the same time yeah. that I was. And I was praying one day and I was like, Jesus, I promise I'll, I'll be your, your best little singer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I told the Lord, I will take, I, I'll go to, I'll go back to college. I'll take voice lessons. I'll, I'll, uh, you know, do the best that I can at your singer. Just please just stop making me preach. Cause I felt like I was just the most miserable preacher <laughs> that had ever walked the earth. And I had zero confidence and, you know, people would try to encourage me. And then right after that, I'd go preach at a church and someone would say 
something, you know, just ridiculous. Like they'd look at my husband and say, um, one day she'll be able to preach as, as good as you. You better watch out. And I mean, there was comments like that nonstop. When looking back, I can say that was truly the Lord. He was using those things to just, he was chiseling me down and getting my spirit right. Because finally, one day I was talking to the Lord and I said, Jesus, let Brother Clifton do it. Let, let Brother Aaron do it. Let Elijah do it. Let all these other people do it because, and I'll sing for them, Lord. I'll sing their altar calls while people are getting saved after their sermons. <laughs> you know? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, when you say that what I gave you is not enough, you're saying that I'm not enough. Wow. And I realized how personally that God took it because, you know, I, I, I don't know, probably everybody's had this happen that you give a gift to somebody and it's like, you can tell on their face, like they didn't really want this, you know, they're just saying yeah. thank you to be, you know, polite, but it's like, if somebody looks at me and says, I don't like this, why did you get me this? Like, I'm going to be deeply offended yeah. by that gifts are my love language by the way and so like I think long and hard like I constantly have an, a list on my phone it's like random days I think oh my gosh that'd be a good gift for so and so I have a constant list on my phone of gifts I can give to people just waiting on their birthdays and Christmas <laughs> <laughs> um but so you know I think that's exactly how God is he's given us this anointing these gifts that we have and although we feel like our gift might not be as prominent as others or as strong as others. And maybe our anointing just functions different. I, I remember when I really started getting into my gift of prophecy, honestly, I had to get into preaching good before I got into prophecy. Prophecy yeah. came in a little later for me. Um, my husband was already working so deep in that. And I would just watch him. And I mean, the way that his gift administers is I mean it's bam 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 back to back to back I mean he'll just go from person to person and just hit like 10 people in like you know five minutes and they're like sobbing and weeping on the floor and I'm back there like how did he do that like uh, I can see things but what I learned was my gift of prophecy worked a little different than his yeah and I prophesy a lot by discernment like my gift of discernment's a lot stronger than prophecy in my life. So I use that. And I learned that if I would slow down and just open my eyes, that a lot of the times while I'm preaching, I'll see something while I'm preaching and I'll just, I'll tell it then. And I'll go a few minutes later and I'll see something else and I'll tell it then. It didn't go as speedy yeah. as Elijah's did. And I, I really hated that to begin with. But then I realized that, Mine just ministered in a different way. Yeah. Because some people couldn't listen if it was too fast. You know, they just, you know, have you, I don't know if you've ever done this, but have you ever tried to minister to somebody and right then they, they fell out or, you know, they just are crying or they're speaking in tongues so loud, you know, they're not listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think that God knows that about people. Yeah. He knows that sometimes we get caught up in emotion. You know, and sometimes some of these people have never felt the Holy Ghost before no, and they're yeah, just sure. overwhelmed by such a tangible presence that he can give them, you know, yeah. and if we if we despise the ministry that we have, we're despising what God has given us. Yeah. And God takes that as a direct offense. And I realized when God told me that, that I was making it all about me. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, this is my gift, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this with it. And that's what I want. And I'd pray and I'd say, Jesus, I want my gift to do this. And not that I think that that's, that's wrong, but I, I, I realized that I was trying to enforce my own plan, my mm -hmm. own goal. When God had his own plan with this gift and this calling, when he gave it to me, and that means I pray that my mind don't look exactly the same way as someone else. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you have enjoyed this. Like and subscribe. Like us and follow us on Facebook, Burning Lights Ministries. My husband, Elijah, also has a YouTube and a podcast. It's called The Hearth. I love you guys. 